some changes made. I said there's gonna be some changes made. Changes made. There's a lighthouse on a hillside And it overlooks life's sea And when I'm tossed, you know it sends out a light A light that I might see And the light that shines in darkness Safely lead me on If it wasn't for that old lighthouse My ship would sail no more Now everybody that lives around us They say, why don't you tear that old lighthouse down? The big ships don't sail by this way anymore. And there's no use in that old thing standing round. But then my mind goes back to that stormy night. When just in time, thank God I saw that light. It was the light from that old lighthouse And it still stands up there on the hill And I thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to Him For Jesus is the light Well, good morning. Here I come. I'm right here. <laughs> That's my superpower. I'm invisible. I, uh, we've been having some computer issues this morning, so I stayed back there just, just to make sure everything went according to plan and so far so good. It's just uh, if you go back and watch it live, I know it'll be glitchy maybe. I don't know. Weather, internet, who knows? We're in Kincaid. We, you know, we don't have super fast internet. So, But uh, everybody got their, well, I see some superhero shirts on today. That's good. That's good. Jesus is my superhero, amen? So 
I, I put out a few weeks ago, said this is, you know, the fifth Sunday we kind of try to go back and do the older songs, and I didn't get but one request. I got one piece of paper, and we're going to do one of those songs. But my buddy Ronnie, I've known Ronnie for, well, Camden's 18 years old, so 20 years, 18, 20 years. I know. Pray for me. Yes. Pray for Sister Lynette even more, right? But uh, Jeff Willis, when we sang here, we had a group called River's Edge, and we sang quite a bit, traveled a lot, and he won't leave me alone about this song. So this is his request. Anybody know that old song, Jesus Loves Me? This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yeah, you remember that one? Let's all stand this morning. Since you said you know it, you got to sing it with me, okay? It's not really a worship song, but, you know, the Gaithers did it. Anybody know who the Gaithers are? Yeah, you like the Gaithers? Too bad, you get me today. So me and you, we're going to make up the Gaithers. Jesus loves me This I know For the Bible It tells me so And a little more to him belong they are weak oh but he is strong yeah, yes Jesus loves me Aren't you glad of that this morning? <laughs> I remember as a little kid singing that in Sunday school class, and you know, it's been a long time since I sang that one. Don't ask me to sing it again for a long time. Isn't God good this morning? I give Jeremy some time to get up here. 
So I'm going to brag today. Everybody's like, you got pink on. Where's your superhero shirt? Well, it's kind of twofold. Athens Warriors. Again, I have the mic. You don't. My superhero today is my son sitting back in that sound booth. Yeah. We traveled three and a half hours south yesterday, the Warriors, for the first round of the playoffs, and that young man had two touchdowns, well, three, but two, 160 yards rushing, first play of the game, gone. And I ran all the way down the sidelines with him, and I dropped my phone out of my pocket, got back down to the other end, Pastor Vance. Yep, still sitting where I'm just jumping up and down, you know. I said, thanks, dear, for letting me know. I lost. And she was sitting, I didn't see it. I was watching your son. I don't care about what you're doing, which is fine. That's fine. But, man, I'll tell you what, this, this team has been so much fun to watch. And then the other fold is, how many of those October we kind of, we do on Fridays. We wear pink on Fridays, right, for breast cancer awareness. So all this, is there anybody that survived breast cancer in the house? Or we got one over here. It's not breast cancer, but I just found out this week, a buddy of mine that I work with, he's got lung cancer. So just kind of in honor of those that have survived. You're a superhero, amen. That's not something easy to go through. Right? So let's give them a hand clap and let's just pray for those that have that terrible disease. God can heal. Amen. That's right. So we're going to sing this morning. This is one of the other requests. What a friend we have in Jesus. Now it's a little different, but it's still the same words. Amen. I haven't seen this one for a while either. this high, brother Jim. Amen. 
He's everywhere, and he's always going to listen to what we have need of. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. How great thou art. I love this song. I remember my grandma Austin singing this song, and the spirit just taking over her and just, wow, such great memories of growing up in church. Thank you for that heritage, Jesus.
Come on, church. Give him a hand clap of praise if you believe he's great this morning and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 You know, that's that's actually probably my favorite hymn of all the hymns because when you sing it, it says, my soul. And what that means is everything inside of me has to say how great you are. When we realize how great God really is, when we realize that he is the one who put the planets in orbit, who put the stars in the sky, who spoke things into existence, all we can do is fall upon our face and say, you are a great God. You are worthy of all praise, worthy of all honor, worthy of all glory. And so just put your hands together, open your mouth and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, before the service, Alan shared with me a testimony of, you know, we knew his, his, Shannon, his daughter, was in the hospital, and she was there, and she had, they thought she had a blockage, but he shared with me that God has touched her and healed her, and that, you know, there's just really no explanation for it except the touch of God in her life. That we have a God that still heals, that we have a God that still provides, that we have a God that is with us in the hospital room, at home, at work, no matter where we, where we go or where we are, and we know for certain that this morning he is right here with us and he deserves our praise and our word and our honor and all of our glory. Hallelujah. And as we pray tonight, as we pray this morning, let's pray for the, 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 the event tonight. This is not some kind of celebration. It's not all it is is us trying to love on our community. And it is still my hope that somehow, some way, we're going to have an opportunity to open our mouths, not just open our candy jars, open our mouths and tell someone about Jesus. And that something that we do tonight will just somehow, some way, God will use that, that they will see that we are the salt of the earth, that we are the light of the world, and they'll come to know Christ somehow through this, just some way. And if nothing else, we're going to let these kids in our community know that we love you and that we're here for you. Also, again, as always, remember your one. Uh, yesterday when I was going through our Facebook memories, I saw a picture of Aladdin, And if you see our Facebook page, that's the p- picture I posted, Aladdin and his wife, Halala. And I've been praying for him and praying for him and praying for him. And there's no signs. There's no uh, indications of interest. There's nothing like that. But I still know that Jesus Christ can do everything. I, know, I remember a time in my life where they said, there's no chance that he'll ever get saved. There's no chance that he'll ever come to, to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But here I am today because of the prayers of my parents, the prayers of my grandparents. And so when we pray for our one, it's not something we do in hope. It's something that we do in faith, that we do it in trust, that somehow God is going to draw them to himself and save them by his own blood. And let's pray this morning. Lord, we just come to you because you are great. You are a great God, and there is no words that we can use that can even come close to expressing how great you truly are and that you're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our honor. You're worthy of our our thanksgiving. You're worthy of all these things. And, Lord God, we thank you for this testimony of Shannon that you have touched her body. And I just pray, Lord God, that you will just fill her life with your presence, fill her family with your presence, that every person that she knows she'll be able to share that God touched my life and that God still is a God who heals, still is a God that you can depend upon. And I pray, Lord God, for Aladdin and everyone here who represents someone in their life that they want to see come to Christ more than anything else. We won't stop praying because you still are a God that saves. Your blood still washes away sin. You still redeem. You still justify. You still adopt people into the family of Christ. And I pray for them. And I pray that you will draw them into a relationship with you and change them and transform them into the precious image of your son. And we pray for our event tonight. Lord God, we're not doing this to participate in something evil. We're doing this to say to our community, we love you and we're here for you. And we want to, we want to be able to share our love with you. And I pray, Lord God, for opportunities. I pray for doors and windows to open that we can speak the name of Jesus into people's life. That we can speak the gospel. That we can share a testimony. That we can encourage them and let them know in this dark world that we live in that there is a light, that there is a hope that there is life in Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord God, you will allow us to do that tonight. And in this service, I pray that everything that is said, everything that is done, 
will glorify you and be pleasing in your sight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to continue our worship in the giving of our tithes and offerings. And as we talked about last Sunday, our tithes, we return to God. Our offerings, we give to God. And I want to encourage you to do that. I also want to remind you that this is the last Sunday of the month. This is Mission Sunday. And at the end of the service, the ushers will be standing in the back for you to give a missions offering. Uh, Once again, this will go to our missionaries, Shijo and Madhu Varghese. Uh, They are currently, they live in a missions country, the country that Carrie and I lived in, the United Arab Emirates. And they're working to go to Kazakhstan to bring the gospel there. So they're in an unreached country, wanting to go to an unreached country. I think we need some adult supervision over here from somebody. Uh, So it's a thing of, we want to bless them and be praying for them. They face a challenge that Western missionaries simply don't face. And just be an encouragement for them. They have two small children, but they're ready to go to the ends of the earth to take the gospel with them. And I want you to please continue to give for them. They're going to be our main missions project uh, at the church. And I really, and I'm hoping that one day you will get to meet them because if you meet them, you'll fall in love with them. Uh, I've, I, I just don't know how to get them here. That's the problem. <laughs> it's not that easy to get visas for someone from India and Nepal to come to uh, America. Uh, so ushers, you can come and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, that you are our provider. And God, that we just get, have this opportunity that we can take this test that you give us, that we return unto you what is yours already, the tithe, and that we give to you. We give for things like building funds and other things, but ultimately we give for you. And I pray that you will use everything that is given to this day for your glory, for your honor, and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. so much for your giving. Uh, Again, welcome to our main service. Uh, Anyone that's watching online, we welcome you as well. Uh, (laughs) I keep keep having this image in my head, and I know I shouldn't, but you know, Brent said that he ran with Camden down the sideline. I have a really hard time believing that. (laughs) I've seen Camden run, and I've seen Brent run. Ain't no way he was with Camden. He might have been following Camden, (laughs) but he wasn't with him. (laughs) I'm sorry, I just can't get that out of my head. <laughs> I can't get that out of my head. <laughs> uh, you know, but one thing, I, one thing I didn't know, actually, last Sunday that I wish I'd have known, this month, Brent and Jeremy have been with us for three, with you, not with me, for three years. And so this month is their three-year anniversary. And, uh, and, They are really a blessing to me. I mean, we're we're still cultivating our relationships and our friendships together, and it's just been a really, really blessing to me as a pastor uh, that we're on the same page, and we don't even try to be. And uh, I can't tell you how unusual that is, that every Sunday the songs he chose, you know, chosen, they fit. They work perfectly. And uh, it's not because he knows anything. It's not because we're talking about it during the week. It's just because I believe that God is leading the three of us for his glory, and I just really appreciate them and love them very much. Uh, Just a few announcements. The Trunk or Treat is still tonight. We ask everyone to be here at 4 to set up. We will notify you if for some reason the mayor cancels it because of the weather. Uh, I don't know how that works. We We haven't heard from him. But unless we hear something, we will have the event. If it's really raining outside, we will bring it into the fellowship hall. We will need a few people who are not going to be setting up a booth or whatever, or a trunk or whatever, to kind of 
guide people into the church if that's what we have to do. So if you're, if you're not setting up anything and you don't have anything to do tonight, please come and help us out. Again, this is, this is not a celebration of evil, not even a little bit, okay? If anything, it, it might be contributing to uh, cavities and, you know, stomach aches, but that's about as far as it goes. It is simply us telling the people of our community, we're here for you, and we love you. And again, I am hoping that somehow, some way, we'll get a chance to share. Uh, so again, be here at 4 to set up. It will be from 5 to 7. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a great night. I just really hope that everything works out. Also, peanut brittle sign up. Now, I know when you say peanut brittle, I hear this gasp every time I say that. Yes, it's, it's work. But again, like I said but last week, it's, it's just f- cool to be together. We're not going to be set on a thousand bags or nothing like that. We're going to be here. We're going to make what we make, sell what we sell, and let God do the rest and just enjoy time together and, again, contribute to the the bad health of our community. (laughs) We're really good at that as a church. Give them candy. Give them peanut brittle. Call the dentist. Uh, All right. So, all right. This morning, uh, we have something special. This is Superhero Sunday. Uh, I chose Captain America. Why? Because the shirt was $15. And, <laughs> and, you know, living in the Middle East, I don't have a lot of Jesus t-shirts because it wasn't the best place in the world to wear them <laughs> uh, unless you enjoy death. But uh, the children have planned something this morning, and I'm really uh, excited about the first one especially. Uh, Leandra is going to read a poem that she wrote. And so I would like to welcome her on stage. And after that, the children have a song uh, to, in, a, in a dance to perform for you called Jesus is My Superhero. All right. Yeah. superhero Jesus. I've heard of Superman in all his might. I've heard of Batman, how he stalks the night. I've heard of Thor and his thundering power. I've heard of Wonder Woman with both tenderness and valor. Of Captain Marvel, Flash, Catwoman, and Spider-Man. Of Captain America, Hulk, Aquaman, and Iron Man. For such nonsense, do you know the reason? We have a real superhero with us in every season. I know of one greater than all of these. I know one who can bring fear to its knees. Yes, I know the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came and for our sake died. He's wiser, braver, and stronger. He's better, cooler, and kinder. Yes, he created life itself. My superhero, Jesus, is who I call on for help.
Well, I kept hoping Jeremy would join in with them, so. <laughs> Max, you ain't shy at all, are you, buddy? You must have got that from Grandma, so. <laughs> okay, the children will be with us today. When we have five Sundays in a month, we've decided that we want the children to stay in the service so that they learn uh, what the adult church is all about as well, because one day they will be with us, and so we want them to, to participate with us at least, you know, when we have the fifth Sunday, f- five Sundays in a month. All right. I didn't announce the peanut brittle thing, did I? I did? Did I? Oh, I didn't announce all of, like, the butter stuff. Yeah. Yeah, imperial margin. I don't know if that's better than other margarine, but imperial margin, Pam cooking spray, and sugar. We need that stuff. I forgot that part. So, uh, Actually, this Sunday, uh, <laughs> I had forgotten that the children were going to be with us in the service, and I had a different sermon plan, and I was all studied up, ready to go, and then I realized the children are going to be with us uh, because it was on lust. And so I had a quick uh, thought about that, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to sw- switch sermon sevens and eight, <laughs> and so next week we will discuss that topic. Uh, and also, uh, this, this week, someone brought something to my attention when I preached on ties last week, that I made the statement that, you know, when I was a missionary, I lived off the offering, and as a pastor now, you live off the tithe, and that maybe I should, should actually quantify and, you know, explain that. As a missionary, you don't get money from the church's tithes. You, get, you, you go around from church to church to church, and you raise money, and whatever you get, that's, you know, you, you, you try to survive off of that. And Church of God missionaries have to raise 100% of what we use in the ministry. The Church of God gives us nothing. And, I mean, the good part of that, though, is when you give to a Church of God missionary, they get 100%. You know, with a lot of organizations, if you give $100, they may be getting 90 or 80. Uh, in the Church of God, if you give $100, that missionary gets $100. They don't take anything out. But then when I, when I made the statement that as a pastor, you live off the tithe, I don't mean I get all the tithe. My salary comes from the tithe. A very small portion of the tithe. So I, I just, someone said I might should clarify that just so people who are not raised in the church would understand that. And also this Sunday is Reformation Sunday uh, in which we celebrate Martin Luther in, the, in, in Germany nailing his 95 thesis to the, to the doors of the church in Wittenberg which started the Protestant Reformation which we are all a part of. And uh, you know, a few uh, Sunday nights, I mean, Wednesday nights ago we watched the movie Luther about the, the Protestant Reformation, and, and so, uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's that. So we're going to not talk about lust this morning, and we're going to talk about freeing the mind. Uh, mental bondage is probably what most people are not even aware of going on in their life. This is actually where the battlefield of the soul. Now, very, very often when it comes to spiritual warfare, there's a lot of books badly written on the topic of sp- spiritual warfare. Because we, sometimes we portray it like, you know, there's just demons everywhere in the cookie jar and in the gas tank and, you know, in, at work <laughs> and, and sometimes at home and in other places. And that you know, but a lot of spiritual warfare, most of spiritual warfare simply takes place inside our head. It, I mean, I know all of us grew up watching, I mean, I don't know if we all did, but, you know, like Bugs Bunny or, you know, some kind of cartoon where there was a devil on one side and, a, and an angel on another. Not quite like that, but something like that in which we have two competing forces trying to grab hold of our thoughts and compete with our thoughts. And our thoughts are very, very important to us. And it's very ironic to me when you think about where Jesus was crucified. In John chapter 19, verse 17 and 18, it reads, And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. And they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. That they crucified Jesus in a place called the skull. Now just think about that. That we're talking about spiritual warfare taking place mostly inside our head, and Jesus was crucified on a place named after the human head. But the freedom from bondage... We're, when we were looking for freedom from the spiritual bondage that we place ourselves into, that we open the doors for Satan to come into our life and to influence us in a negative way, we will only be as free as we are free inside our head. 
until we accept what Jesus has done, accept what he has accomplished for us, and we actually believe it, we actually win the battle up here, we will never ever truly be free. In Genesis chapter 3, Satan took mankind captive, and we've talked about that already. He didn't take man captive with a gun or a bomb or a knife or a weapon of any sort. He captured us with a lie. He took us captive simply by a lie because his first words was, did God really say? Placing doubt in our mind about God's word. And that lie has affected us for well over 6,000 years. That we are still living with the consequences of man believing that one lie. And before Satan ever beats you, before he will ever defeat you, he must first disarm you. God had given Adam and Eve his word. God had given Adam and Eve a commission. And the first thing the devil did was to call into question God's word. And that is his exact strategy that he uses against us all the time. And once we are disarmed, once we begin to doubt God's word, we are as much as already defeated. But Jesus came, the incarnate word of God, the word made flesh. He came to bring us back to the truth so that he could set us free. And the first place that we have to find freedom is in our mind. Jesus, on a hill named after a human skull, came to set our minds free from the devil. And so I'm going to talk about three factors to finding freedom in our minds. Number one... Spiritual warfare in our enemy, the main battlefield, the main place of warfare is in our thoughts. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 5. Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of Christ, of God... And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, I've heard that preached all my life. I grew up in the Church of God and then uh, got first originally saved in the Assemblies of God. So two Pentecostal denominations that basically believe exactly the same thing. And I've heard that, of that text preached over and over again very, very poorly. In the sense that sometimes we're talking about this warfare and we think it's all up here. We think that this battle that we're facing is that, you know, like demons are chasing us down 104 and they're just trying, but it's all right here. It's all in our head. And the Bible is telling us, even in this text, that it starts in your head. Paul says we're in a war, but he tells us that the war is against our thoughts and that we're taking every thought captive into obedience to Christ. Any thought that you have, any thought that you and I ever have, takes you captive. Any thought. War is about being, is about killing or being killed. There is no, there is nothing in between. It is one or the other. Any thought you have not taken captive to obedience to Christ has taken you captive. Paul reminds us that our warfare is not against flesh. He's basically saying your warfare is not against people. It is against your thoughts. It is a war of the spirit. It is a war because we choose what we think. We choose what we're going to think about. And we are to pull down our thoughts. Whatever our thoughts are have, whatever we have, we have to pull them down and make them obedient to Christ. In other words, make them obedient to the word of God. But the only way that we can do that is if we know the word of God. And so that's why we have to study it and read it and and be good disciples. Jesus never, ever called us to be converts. He called us to be disciples, which means followers of Jesus every single day that we follow him. How do we follow him? Through his word, through prayer, through the disciplines of our faith, through fellowship with other Christian believers, through church services just like this is the only way that we have in this planet to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But bondage is basically a house of thoughts, a collection of thoughts, a pattern of thinking. Fear, depression, lust, anger, addictions, the past is all just a collection of thoughts. How do you think about these things is going to determine how you live according to them. The problem is not with the circumstances you face. The problem is how we think about it. 
It doesn't matter what you're going through today. It doesn't matter what doctor's report you got. It doesn't matter what you know, is, it has happened this week. It's how you think about it is how it's going to affect you. The problem is not our past. It's how we think about our past. Some people just live in their past. I want to take that somewhere, but I'm, I'm, I have those little things on my shoulder saying, you don't want to go there. <laughs> Some people really live in the past. Some people live in the past in the sense of that was their glory time. And, and I was talking a little bit about that this morning, that, you know, that, that you know, their times in high school, or those other kind of that, that was their glory time, and, and they might be 60 years old, and they're still talking about when they were 15. But then some people, we've, you know, like myself, we've had a very, very painful past. We've had hurt in our past, failure, great sin in our past. And if we're not careful, we will let that control us now. Even though we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that we have been made new creatures in Christ, we still allow that to control how we live. But Paul says that we're to take every thought captive. And I looked that word up in Greek. You know what the word every there, translated every, means in Greek? It means every. Every thought. The thought you're having right now, the Bible says, take that thought captive to Jesus Christ. You know what the word captive means? It literally means, in this text, a prisoner of war. Basically, by spear point or sword point, take your thoughts captive. Well, we all know that we have a sword called the sword of the Spirit, and we are told by the Apostle Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, thus we're told by God himself to take every thought we ever have captive to, in obedience to Christ, in obedience to God's Word, which means that everything that we think, every thought that we ever have, we are supposed to place it under obedience to the Word of God. But far too many of us let our thoughts go with our culture, with our family history, with our past, with our circumstances, with what someone said about us instead of what the Word of God says. And that's why we live miserable lives. That's why we live without peace and without joy and without hope, because we're not living living by the word of God, we're living by the word of the world. Again, every thought in our minds is a prisoner of spiritual warfare. Every thought. The question is, is it a prisoner of Satan or is it a prisoner of Jesus Christ? Every thought we must take captive of Christ. Every thought must be put under Jesus as we listen to God's word. And how do you do that? Okay, the thought you're having right now, is it biblical? Now, you can only answer that question if you know the Bible. Now, there's a lot of people who we, they think they know the Bible, but they haven't studied it, they don't read it, they don't ever pick it up, and you, you can't really know it. Now, no one is going to learn this word an hour a week on Sunday morning. You have to go to the Word of God yourself. You have to study. And then you can come and you can ask questions and you can put yourself around people who can help you learn and study the Word of God. But is the thought you're having right now biblical? There is no neutral thought. There is no Switzerland in our minds. It is either a thought that is evil or a thought that is good. If you're thinking about where you're going to eat lunch in a few hours, that's not from God. <laughs> and then in the text we just read, it talks about arguments and strongholds. Every area of our life where the devil has introduced thoughts into our mind that are not consistent to the truth of God's word is exactly what it's talking about there. And many of us, many of us, I would say all of us, believe things that were not planted in our mind by God, but planted there by the devil. Strongholds that are still in our mind. We may have been Christians for 30 or 40 years, but those thoughts are still in our head. And they, they form this barrier from us to really know God. You think God is angry with you? You think God hates you? You think God doesn't love you? You think God is just just angry tyrant in the sky just waiting to crush you at the first opportunity? I can tell you God didn't plant that thought in your mind. But there are many people in the church, many people, good, God-loving 
walking in the path of holiness the best that they know how still believe that thought because at some time in their life the devil has planted that and it has created a stronghold that God could never use you that God could not possibly love you that God could never forgive you for the things you've done and we have to and Paul tells us that we have to tear down those strongholds and believe what the word of God says This is how Satan takes us captive. It's through our thoughts. Thoughts like, you're addicted. There's no chance you can get out of that. You're addicted. Just give up. You ever heard that thought? I hear it every day. It doesn't hurt anyone. Your spouse will never know. Let me just tell you something, guys. Your spouse always knows. Because they're a whole lot smarter than we are, all right? It's only a little lie. I mean, mean, tell me you have not heard these. You don't have to pay your tithes. That's Old Testament. I cannot stop. I'm alone. They hurt me. You just don't understand. It's my parents' fault. It's cultural. Oh, I've heard that one a lot. If you see yourself this way, if you believe those thoughts, you are captive to the thoughts that Satan has planted in your mind and that you must bring them down through the Word of God. You must, we must see ourselves the way God sees us. We must have his thoughts about us. How do we know what they are? They're right here. Do you want to know what God is thinking about you right now? Read the book. These are the thoughts of Almighty God. I mean, think about it. I I mean, I read a lot, okay? I read probably two to three books a week. I mean, reading to me is just, you know, why in the world would I ever not read? I can't even begin to imagine when I can learn from someone, when I can have God speak to me through other people. Why would I not pick up books to read? But this book right here speaks to me more like any other. These are the thoughts of Almighty God. How can I not possibly pick up this book? Why? Because Satan will do everything in his power to make sure you don't. He will make you too busy. He will make something really interesting that you like on television. He will distract you. He will use even church people to distract you. It's amazing how many times when I'm in my abiding time in the morning, I get a text from a church member. It's amazing. I'm like, okay, now I know who's, who's <laughs> what Satan's using in my church. I'm just kidding, all right? Just kidding, Ronnie. (laughs) Remember, I joke with those I love. So So just wait. (laughs) Give me a few years and I'll be abusing all of you. Uh, But we must believe what the Word of God says, not just about Him. We have to believe that, of course. But we also have to believe what the Word of God says about us. I am a new creature in Christ. I am joint heirs with Jesus. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever really thought that through? Have you ever really thought about the temple in the Old Testament? That when the high priest, if he didn't do everything just perfectly once a year, if he went past that curtain, bam, he's killed. He's dead in the presence of God. Now I am that temple and you are that temple. And that the third person of the Holy Trinity rests inside of us, lives inside of us, dwells in us, abides in us. Have you ever really thought about that? That I am a, you and I are children of the Most High God, the one who we just sung about how great thou art. He is my Father. He is your Father. Have you ever really thought about that? And salvation begins when we begin having the thoughts of God. No matter what kind of sinner we are, this is where the thoughts, this is where salvation begins. When we realize, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. That I cannot do it on my own. I cannot walk this life of impurity and holiness in a way that is acceptable to God. I cannot do it on my own. I'm a sinner. That is the first thought we ever have that is a godly thought. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus is my Savior. I will follow Him. Then we begin that path of having godly thoughts. Do not believe the devil's lies. Do not believe the things that he has built up in your mind. 
Be the person who God wants you to be by taking your thoughts captive and subject to the Word of God. Pull down the stronghold. And I don't mean, you know, you know some of these people who... Artificial self-righteousness. That, you know, their arm could be falling off and bleeding. And, oh, I'm blessed, you know. And, you know, I'm not talking about that. It's okay to be transparent. My whole, vi- my whole vision for this church is to create a church in which we can be real in which we can be truthful with one another. That when we come in and say, I'm hurting today, will you pray for me? I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time. I just can't seem to overcome this sin. Will you help me, keep, stay, help me stay accountable? I want us to be a church of vulnerability and weakness, to realize that the only reason that we're here is Jesus Christ went to a cross and died for us, and that we are completely dependent upon him, and that my brothers and sisters, although they may have different sins than I have, we all are in the same boat together, and we're supposed to be helping one another, building each other up, and edifying each other. That's the kind of church I want us to be. But that's only going to happen when we tear down the lies, that I have to be some kind of holy superhero before my brothers and sisters, or they may think less of me. (laughs) Trust me, I couldn't think less of you. No, I'm just kidding, okay? (laughs) This side thought that was funny. This side's really uh, offended. Either way, you got to forgive me, all right? No, It doesn't matter. When we talked about that with the fear of man, we talked about it doesn't matter what other people think about us. It matters what God thinks about us, and we need to be truthful with one another. We need to be honest. We need to be open and transparent. You say, that's frightening. Yes, it is. But it's also biblical. And it is. Like Dave just said, it's freedom. When I don't have to pretend anymore. When I don't have to pretend that I walk on water as a pastor, when I don't have to pretend that I got it all together, that I don't have to pretend that I struggle. And I I mean, honestly, I've been rebuked for sharing weakness. But I have a gospel that says, through my weakness, His grace is sufficient, that He will use it for His glory and His purpose. And I've been in ministry for 30 years, and God hasn't used one of my strengths to yet. He uses and He works through weakness. We will not solve our spiritual problems with our flesh. Our flesh or our will cannot overcome our thoughts. It's a spiritual battle. We need the Holy Scriptures. We are the gatekeepers of our mind. Satan cannot, cannot decide what you think. God will not decide what you think. We choose who we allow to live on the throne of our minds. To be free, we must understand the mind is the battlefield where Satan wants to fight and defeat you. To be free, we must take Jesus, the Lord, and let him be Lord of our thoughts. And then he will fight for us. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But what do you got to do first? Submit. Submit first. If we don't submit, he ain't going to go nowhere. If we don't resist, he's not going to flee. The second thing is we must understand the word of God as a spiritual weapon. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, be strong. And I I, I really want you to, I, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will help you to hear this from him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God. Notice it doesn't say, God will put the whole armor for you. It says for us to put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day And having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. And put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. He says, be strong in the Lord. Notice he doesn't say, be strong in yourself. One of the biggest lies that Satan has put in our mind, we can do it. We can do it. 
You know where I know I'm getting in trouble in ministry? When I think I got this. When I think I got this, I know I'm in big, big, big trouble. But if God has asked you to do something and you're in a position of, God, I have no idea what to do. I cannot possibly do this. This is impossible. There is no way. This, I mean, my personality, everything else, I just can't do this. You're in a perfect place to be used by Almighty God because you will cling to him and you will hold on to him and you're not going to let go. You're going to be so desperate for God because you're going to say, God, if you don't speak to me, I can't speak to your people. If you don't give me the strength, I can't do it. If you don't provide, I can't do this or do that. If we will just trust Trust in God and stop trusting in ourselves, we will be able to be free. But how do we put on the armor? There are six elements of the armor of God. They're all truth, by the way. But the first one is the belt of truth. So basically, we have to make a decision to use the Word of God as our foundation. How do you make your decisions? Every month or week or whatever when you get paid, how do you make a decision how you will spend that money? In your marriage, how do you make a decision how you're going to treat your spouse or your children or your parents? How do you make a decision whether you come to church or not? How do you make a decision what you do with your free time? How do you make a decision what you watch on television? I hope it's it's through the Word of God. Every decision we make, Every choice we make has, this should be our foundation. This must be our foundation. In our board meetings, no matter, sometimes we're talking about some of the most trivial things, building things, I still want those decisions based in the Word of God. I want everything we do as a church, everything I do as a father, everything that I do as a husband, everything as I do as a member of my society, I want it to be based on the Word of God. Now, some of them are hard. Some of them are really difficult, okay? I'll be honest. I have trouble praying for my leaders, the leaders of my nation. I have a lot of trouble praying for them. Well, the the kind of prayers you should be praying for them, I'll say that. You know, calling fire down from heaven, that prayer is pretty easy. But I have trouble with that. But the Word of God doesn't give me a choice there. If my foundation is going to be on him, Paul wrote that when his leader was Nero. And so I have to follow the word of God. Base our decisions on truth. The next thing is the breastplate of righteousness. Basically talking about the human heart. Protecting the heart. Satan will try to kill you in one or two ways. Okay, Knowing the tactics of the enemy are very important. When I was in the military, we studied our enemy. Because we wanted to know what they were trying to do against us. Satan wants to kill you and he wants to do it in one or two ways. One, he's going to tell you you've done too much wrong. He wants to condemn you. He wants you to feel condemned because if you feel condemned, you're going to give up. If you feel condemned, it's going to be hard to pray. If you feel condemned, you're not going to read the Word of God. If you feel condemned, you're not going to want to come into church because you feel condemned. You're going to go out into the edges of society, and that's where the lion that comes to kill and destroy hunts, and he's going to wait for you there. So that's the first way that he wants to kill us. The second way, he's not going to tell you that you're condemned. He's going to tell you you're holy. Oh, you're so holy. You are so holy. You are so much holier than that person sitting beside you. Not a word, Ronnie. You are so much holier than sister so-and-so. Oh, you know, you, you always sit in the front of the church. You always read your Bible. You always pray. You always do these things. You are so much holier. Than you. They shouldn't even have the right to be around you. You're so holy. Those are the two ways. He will create condemnation in us or self-righteousness in us. That is his tools. But the breastplate says no. The blood of Christ has washed me clean. I am not condemned. My sin is gone forever, and I now have the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ accredited to my account. I have a new heart and a new life because of him. Every time Satan reminds you of your sins and your past, remind him of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I remember this shirt years and years ago. Every time Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. You're getting beat up and you feel condemned for things you did before you got saved or even since you got saved but you know you repent of, read the end of the book to him. Read it out loud and say, Satan, I want to read to you today. And I guarantee you he's going to leave you alone. Punish the enemy 
for coming against you in your mind. Every time he tries to condemn you, remind him of the victory that Christ has gained over him through the crucifixion and resurrection. And like Martin Luther said, every time Satan would come against him and say, you know, you're, you're worthy of hell and you're just pathetic, he'd say, you know, devil, you're right. But I had one who came from heaven, who died in my place and resurrected from the dead, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and me. And it's, you know, it's the thing, no matter what the devil wants to come against me in the past, Jesus says my future is in him, my future is set, I have a place with him, he's preparing a dwelling place for me that where one day where he is, I will be also. Amen. Punish him. It is the righteousness of God, of Christ, not my own righteousness. The helmet of salvation. Trust in salvation that Jesus earned by his death. This is a very common one that we have. You're not really saved. You ever felt that? I'm not really saved. I remember when I was a kid when the, the church, maybe we preached, maybe they preached too hard back then. Now maybe we preach too soft. But I remember when people got saved every week. <laughs> and they wanted to be sure because the preaching was so hard, you're like, I think I'm saved, but I'm going down there just in case. We shouldn't be afraid that we are not saved. You should know. You should know because of Christ and your relationship. And we should think saved thoughts. You say, how do you do that? Philippians 4 and 8 tells us. This is not on the screen, Camden. But Philippians 4 and 8 says, think on things that are true, things that are noble, things that are right, things that are lovely, things that are adorable. Think good things. Think godly things. The mind is protected when I think the way God wants me to think. And let me say this, post the way God wants you to post. Philippians 4.8, I ask myself that before I post something. Is it true? Is it noble? Is it right? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? And then it tells us to, to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Basically, that means let your feet take you where God wants you to go. And God doesn't want you to go home away from society. God does not want you to stay home on Sunday mornings. God does not want you to stay away from your lost friends and your lost family. God will plank, take your feet to those who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. He will help you to walk in truth and walk in holiness. That our life is not about money. Our life is not about possessions. Our life is not about fame and fortune. Our life is about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the darkest corners of this globe, to our community, to those who don't know him, to those who are lost, and tell them about Jesus Christ. That is what every life in Christ is about. And if we're not doing it, we're going against the very purpose that Jesus has for us. The devil wants you to take those feet, those shoes off your feet and never fulfill the purpose that God has for our lives. In America, amongst born-again Christians, only 5% of born-again Christians in America have ever shared their faith with a non-Christian person. Only 5%. And we wonder, wonder why the church is dying. We wonder where the 20-year-olds are. We wonder where the youth are and the 30-year-olds are. We wonder where these generations are that are lost and in sin and dying and going to go to a devil's hell. It's because we're not opening our mouth and opening our life and showing them and telling them about Jesus Christ, our very purpose. So you can, either, you can live for pleasure, you can live for money, you can live a worthless life, or you can choose to live the life that Jesus Christ has for you. The reason that you and I are still alive and breathing is that God has somewhere and someone for us to go to, a purpose for us to fulfill. For one, to walk in a holiness in this life, but the reason that we walk in holiness in this life is so that when we go into our community, we go into our family, that they're actually going to believe what we say, that they're actually going to see, the, see Jesus that we talk about. When we lived in the Middle East, people were always asking me, you know, what is the secret of winning Muslims to Christ? It's very easy. Show them Jesus. 
Not just tell them about Jesus. you got to show them Jesus. But you want to know what the secret is of winning young people in America? Show them Jesus. They're tired of hearing about a Jesus that they never see in the people who are talking about him. We need to show this generation, show our nation, Jesus Christ, who he really, really is. Not just in word, but also in our life. Do not allow Satan to steal our purpose and replace it with something small and insignificant. Do not let the gospel be replaced with the things of this world. Then Paul tells us to take the shield of faith, the shield of trust. Now, it's not like Captain America's shield, you know, that big around. The shield that Paul is talking about is a full body shield. It would cover the entire body. And what it's basically saying, have faith in the truth that's wrapped around your going, that, that foundation. Have faith in the righteousness that was provided to you by Christ Jesus. Have faith in the salvation paid by his blood. Have faith and trust in the gospel which is and defines our very purpose. And then the sword of the Spirit. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. And don't answer out loud. Because one, if you don't answer, if you lie, hmm, or... If you boast, both are not good. Have you read this book this week? Don't say anything. Have you read it? Just ask yourself that question. Have you spent any amount of time in the Word of God this past week? Then you're unarmed if you haven't. We have to read it. We have to learn it. We have to study it. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is... Attacked by Satan, he is tempted by the devil. Jesus had not eaten in 40 days. He was weak. He was hungry. How many of you have ever fasted 40 days? I'm sure he's hungry. How did Jesus defeat the devil? Did he call the 72,000 angels that he had anytime he wanted them? No. Did he make an earthquake come under you know, Satan's feet and swallow him up? No. He didn't even thump him in the head, which he probably could have done. He beat the devil with three Bible verses. He defeated the enemy of our soul with Sunday school material. The Word of God. The Bible is a nuclear bomb when it comes to our arsenal. This is the most powerful weapon you will ever possess in your life. But is it in you? Is it in us? Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says, Indeed, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Wow. This is a powerful tool. You know, I read a lot of books, but this book reads me. This book will read you. That's why we don't want to read it. That's why there's entire sections where they will think, oh, I'll just go around that part. Because we know it's going to eat our lunch. I don't know if you have that saying. and That's an Alabama thing. I'm sorry if you don't understand it. I'll translate later. It's going to kick your tail, all right? I didn't get to use those in the Middle East either. It's all right. Satan fears the Word of God. Why do you think he worked so hard for us not to read it, not to study it? Whatever is attacking you, Whatever is attacking your mind, whatever sins you can't overcome, you won't do it without the Word of God. My dad, before I was born, used to smoke. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not condemning that at all. I mean, it, it, it kills you. you know, there's 52 types of disease you can get from smoking. And he wanted to stop. Felt like he couldn't. Felt like he was addicted. And he always used to keep his cigarettes in his, in his, you know, in his shirt pocket. And so he took his cigarettes out and he got one of those little Gideon New Testaments and he put that in his pocket. And every time he wanted a cigarette, he'd pull out that New Testament and read it until that craving went away. And that's how he overcomes smoking, okay? By the power of the Word of God. Nothing, nothing can take us captive when we use this. I keep thinking I need to put my Bible in the refrigerator, you know. <laughs> hey, maybe that's, maybe that's the secret, you know. Every time I go, <laughs> I'm not hungry, I'm not hungry, I'm not hungry. You just ate 30 minutes ago, you moron. But Satan works so hard to get us not to read the Bible. Can't sleep? Read the Bible. You'll go to sleep in five minutes. 
The next thing is we must understand that biblical meditation is part of spiritual warfare. Now, I've got to be careful here because when you say the word meditation, many people think of some little monk sitting there, you know, with their legs crossed or that kind of thing or your feet over your head. Or That's not what we're talking about. Meditation was biblical long before the Eastern religions took it. Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3 says, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. Meditation is actually quite easy if you're not American, in the sense that we, get, we let our mind get so, so busy with things that we don't like silence, I mean, think, I mean, I want you to think about your life. When, if I was just to stop talking for 10 minutes, how uncomfortable that would make you. And I've been with people, <laughs> I've been with people who really, really don't like silence. And I'm not looking at anybody because I'm looking over here, okay? <laughs> and if it's silent for 20 seconds, you can tell they're thinking, I've got to say something, I've got to say something. I had the, 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 the lady that Leandra is named after, she was, she was one of my best friend's wife. Because, you know, when we were naming our kids, we were, we were working with Jews and Muslims and, and Hindus. And, and, you know, we're like, if we, if we give our kid this name, it'll offend this people. If we give them that name, it'll offend that people. And we were trying to think of a name that wouldn't offend nobody. And so I, we named her Leandra because nobody knows what that means. So uh, it actually means brave as a lion, <laughs> which I think is funny. And Leandra thinks it's funny. But anyway, I, don't, I already forgot. Oh, Leandra. And, but... The Leandra that, was, that Leandra was named after, she was a hairdresser, and lovely girl. I went to high school with her. We graduated together, and she can talk. I mean, she can talk. And I guess, you know, in that business, you've got to talk a lot. And, and, and we were going to give her a ride to the airport in Atlanta, and that's three hours, okay? And so I was trying to keep up with her, and, enter, you, know, and you know, Carrie was like, you know, and she couldn't, she couldn't do it. And, I was trying to, and, at the, and when we finally got to the airport, she says, Wow, you guys are so quiet. And I'm thinking, I won't talk for a week after this, you know. <laughs> but we don't like silence. If we have a little bit of silence, we pull out our phones, okay? I've, since I've been in America, I've caught myself doing that during commercials and watching a football game. And I've started now when I watch a football game, I put my phone somewhere else. I'm like, I'm not going to let that little thing control me like that, Okay? But we hate silence. Meditation is really easy. The Bible refers to it as ruminating, and we've talked about this before. A sheep, when it eats, it ruminates. It eats something, it swallows it. Later on, it brings it back up. I know that's disgusting. You were thinking about food a minute ago, so, okay. It thinks it, and it chews on it a while, it swallows it again, then it brings it back up, chews on it some more. That's what ruminating is, and that's the word that the Bible uses for meditation. Basically, it means think about it. Think about the Word of God, to go over it repeatedly in our mind. Meditation is not Eastern or New Age. It is scriptural. Read the scripture, put it on your heart, and read it and think about it. And as you go through your day, bring it back up and think about it some more. That's what it means to meditate on the scripture, to bring it up over and over again. And if you have to, post it all over your house. Carrie's done that in several places we live. She put things on the bathroom mirror. She'll put things in the kitchen. Scripture's everywhere, so there's almost nowhere you could go that you wouldn't be able to be reading the Word of God. If that, if that works for you, do that. Because, you know, basically, it's like hardware and software. Now, I know some people are more tech-challenged than others, but so I'll try to... Hardware is the machine, okay? Hardware is that box that sits on your desk. The software is what makes that box really work. We are incredible hardware. God created something incredible when he created a human being. Just read a simple book on the human brain, and it'll be like, wow. That the human fingertip is the most sensitive thing known to man. That the way God made us is just incredible, incredible hardware. The problem is, the software is the programming. Our software is corrupted. We, God made us brilliant, but the software has a virus, and, the sof and that virus is called sin. God's word is the software that we were intended 
our hardware to run off of. But Satan introduced that virus into us, and it's messed us up. And so what we have to do is reprogram ourselves. And we reprogram ourselves through the Word of God. That we change these sinful thoughts, these bad thoughts that Satan has tried to give us, and we replace them with the software that God intended us to function off of. The Word of God reprograms our brain. By meditating on the Word of God, we're downloading the software And it removes the virus that Satan has planted in us. And when we we reprogram ourselves with the word of God, it will affect how we operate. It will affect how we run and behave and think. Now I'll give you some practical medication applications here, okay? Let's say you have some issues. We all have issues, all right? Don't use that as an excuse, though. Uh... We, this, this past weekend, I was at a minister's conference in, 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 in Champaign. Uh, by the way, really good Arabic food there. And, and also from really sinful students. But I, I know where my kids are not going to college <laughs> after I went there. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's a thing of, and we met an overseer. And he said that we've gone from, and, and, and this is, I thought, just a beautiful statement. He says, we've gone to let them come as they are, to let people stay as they are. And the church can't do that. Yes, you can come as you are. But God's going to change us. God's going to transform us. But let's say you have an issue. Let's say you're struggling with lust or gossip. Don't be meditating on the book of Numbers. It's probably not going to help you very much. Such and so begets such and so begets such and so begets such and so begets such. That's not probably going to help you so much. Okay, let's say you're, you're struggling with guilt and condemnation. Okay, I did. I have a life full of very, very, very horrible things that I have done to other people. Very things that, that, that some things I've never even shared, not even with Carrie. That I did in war and that I did in my life. It's just things that I, 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 I just, I, and, and for years I felt so condemned. For years I would have nightmare after nightmare after nightmare waking up in cold sweats. And I felt so condemned. And then I started focusing on one verse. I started meditating on one verse, Romans 8, verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? So you think about whatever you did. If you're a person who lives in condemnation and guilt, you take that verse and you think about it and you think about it and you think about it. That verse is not just something that just some little poet wrote, some little somebody put on the Facebook. That was written by the hand of God through the Apostle Paul. He wants us to realize that, that if we are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. It doesn't matter what I did before. It doesn't matter the pain that I caused, the suffering that I caused, the heartache that I caused. There I am now in Christ Jesus and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you don't have to feel condemned. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel that way. You should be free from that through Christ. Repeat on it, you know, meditate on it, think about it. Okay, let's say your issue is fear. Fear of what people think. Fear of the future. Fear of finances. Fear of your health. Fear about your kids. Oh, I used to have that too. I remember when Leander and Kendra were born, I was so afraid Something was going to happen to them. I could hear them breathe at night. And I would just sit there, and if they, uh, I would just, usually I'd tell Carrie to go do it, but sometimes I'd get up and go look. You know, usually I'd, hey, Carrie, go check on them. And I was so afraid, and finally I'm like, you know, and, and there is, there's, a, there's a healthy fear when it comes to that. There's a normal biological fear when it comes to that of, of caring about what happens to your children, but this was chronic. It was controlling me. I'm like, God, you've got to set me free from this. You've got to deliver me from this. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. So I, I realized immediately, I'm afraid. God didn't give me that fear. God is not making me afraid that my children are going to stop breathing. God's not making me afraid that I'm not going to be able to do this financially or that I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. God's not, not afraid that I've that I, I, I got to worry or be concerned. or other God's not doing that. He cannot, will not give me fear. If you are afraid, God didn't give it to you. And I'm going to read to you Psalms 91, or I'm going to try to. I'm getting to where I need reading glasses. I'm going to have to get a bigger print Bible. I know that. I'm going to read Psalm 91. 
And I don't normally do this when I preach, but I want, I'm going to read the whole chapter. And I don't remember if I put it on the screen or not. I want you to hear the word of God. I want you to hear from God's own mouth to you. And so whatever you're struggling with, hear God in this. And you say, oh, how do I know if it's God? If anything I read leaps out at you, or for a moment you feel almost like it's speaking to you, that's God, okay? It's really that simple. That is God speaking to you. Psalm 91, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with the feathers and under his wing you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the wilderness darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up you in their hands so you will not, that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and on the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent because he loves me. The song that we sung this morning says the Lord I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He he will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, I hope you heard God speak to you, either through all of it or part of it. But it's something we need to realize His word is powerful. Meditate on the scripture. Do it at least four times a day. And we talked about this a little bit in the past, but the Bible tells us when. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 9. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them on an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So basically he's telling you to meditate on the word of God when you go to bed at night, when you wake up in the morning, when you're sitting around the house relaxing your idol, or when you're traveling somewhere. Basically, when you're not busy. When you're not busy, meditate on the word of God. Don't pick up your phone. Meditate on the word of God. An example, you wake up in the middle of the night. Here comes the attack. How many of you have been attacked when you wake up in the middle of the night? The rest of you are lying. So, or that you didn't wake up. You wake up in the middle of the night, you start being afraid. Maybe something outside. Maybe it's your pastor. You never know. (laughs) Or you start worrying about the bills. You start worrying about work. You start worrying about your kids. You start worrying about your marriage. You start worrying about your family. You wake up in the middle of the night, lust comes. If you have a scripture that you've been meditating on, ready to bring, bring up at any moment's notice, you're armed. You're armed and you're dangerous and you can defeat any enemy if you have that scripture ready. But let's say if you don't have a scripture ready, you're in trouble. Because you have nothing to fight that thought. You have nothing to take it captive. Your thoughts are not as powerful as the devil's thoughts. Another Alabama saying, he will clean your plow. It makes sense in Alabama. I've actually never really thought that made sense, but it makes sense in Alabama. God's thoughts are more powerful than the devil's thoughts. So if you replace the devil's thoughts with God's thoughts, you're going to win. Because you cannot take a thought out of your mind. You can only replace it with a more powerful, better thought. Let me give you an example. Don't think about a pink elephant. 
don't think about a pink elephant. Don't think about a pink elephant. Whatever you do, don't think about a pink. Stop it. Don't think about a pink elephant. Stop thinking about a pink elephant. What are you thinking about? A pink elephant. No matter what you do, you can't get that stupid pink elephant out of your mind. Now, I wanted to use a crimson element, ele elephant, but I didn't want to use it in a negative way. So, but the more I tell you to do it, the more you want to do it. Blue frog. Blue frog. Blue frog. A blue frog. You ever seen a blue frog? I've seen a blue frog. Blue frog. But you're not thinking about the pink elephant. You have to replace the thought. If you're sitting there, okay, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're lusting. Don't lust, don't lust, don't lust. You're just going to lust more. But if you replace it with something pure, like the word of God, it will overpower that thought and replace it. When the devil comes to you with fear, worry, lust, or whatever, and you can't get that thought of your, out of your head, use the word of God. He has no chance. Satan says you're condemned. Again, you can say, well, no, wait a minute, devil. Romans 8, 1 and 3. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life is Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So when a Satan comes to you with fear, you come back at him with the word of God. When Satan comes to you with lust, you come back to him with the word of God. When Satan comes to you with condemnation, you come back with him with the word of God. That your mind is locked and loaded and you're ready for a fight. One of the things I always, the, the girls when we watch movies, now I do like war movies. And I watch a lot of movies, and you know, if there's no shooting in it, I don't like it. You know, even like romantic comedies, I'm like, can't you shoot somebody? Okay. But one thing I hate, and the girls always hate, because I always have to point for, you know, if you, know, you ever watch a movie with a nurse, and they're like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. I do the same thing in, mil in army movies, all right? Hey, that's not how you do that. That's not, and the girls hate it, okay? You ever notice that, you know, they're walking in the jungle or whatever, and they hear the enemy, and then they load their gun? You don't do that. How stupid is that? The gun's loaded. When you go, when you know the enemy's coming, you have a bullet in the chamber. You're ready to go. So you know when you're in the morning. You know at night. You know when you're sitting idle. You know when you're on a journey. The devil is coming. Be locked and loaded with the word of God. Have a bullet in your chamber ready to come back at him when he tries to make you sin, when he tries to control your mind. Are you captive to thoughts of lust, to thoughts of fear, to thoughts of condemnation? Arm yourself with the Word of God. The more that you know this book, the more you will be prepared, the more you will be trained. In 1989, the December of 1989, I, mean, I, mean, I, I was in high school the year before that, I was 17, I went to my recruiter, and I said, I want to jump out of planes and kill people. The recruiter was all for that. I signed, uh, you know, my parents didn't really want me, they didn't ever tell me that, but they didn't really want me to go in the military, but I, I signed up. I went to basic training in Fort Benning, Georgia, which was 13 weeks. Then I went to airborne school, which is another three weeks, and counting hell week, which is the week before that. Got to my unit at Fort Bragg, and three days later, I found myself doing what I asked the recruiter to do. I jumped out of a plane to kill people. But the thing about it is, soldiers, they don't just take them the first day you sign up and throw you in war. They prepare you first. They train you first. They teach you. That's what... The Word of God does. It helps prepare us for the battles that we face. We lose so often because we're not prepared. Every one of us knows what it's like to have a sin that we commit. God, I'm sorry. And then you commit it again. And God, I'm sorry. And you commit it again. And God, I'm sorry. And you commit it again. And it's just been this endless cycle. And it's because we're not arming ourselves with the Word of God. The secret is the Word of God. 
No, we're not going to walk this life perfectly. I wish we could. I wish that when we, you, you came up here and you prayed, God, forgive me, that you walk out of here and you're just perfect. But you're not. Now, I know there's people in this world who think they are, and they're wrong. And if you're perfect, please don't attend this church. You're really going to make the rest of us feel bad, okay? We're not perfect. There is no perfect church because it just doesn't exist. We're all struggling with this. We're all fighting these wars, and I hope we're fighting them not just privately. That's why we need to be vulnerable and transparent so that we can fight them together. But arm yourself, train yourself, prepare yourself with the Word of God. The mind is the battlefield. The Scripture is our weapon. Meditation on the Word is our training. And we can be free. And we can go to war. And we can win. I'd like for you to stand. As always, I want to ask, what has God said to you in this message? And God has spoken. Not because I spoke, because I know that any time the word is preached, he speaks. When it's preached in truth. So I'd like for you to bow your head and close your eyes and ask yourself, what has he said to you? Maybe you're here and you don't even know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're lost and you know it. Maybe you use excuses like the church is full of hypocrites or... uh, There's nothing that God has that I want. I've said all those things in my life. I remember when I gave my life to Christ, the last thing I ever thought I needed was was Jesus. But nothing made me feel more alive. And I don't say that because I'm a preacher. Jesus is the source of all peace, all hope, all joy. I talked about a warfare here. Yeah, it's a battle, but you face that battle anyway. And if you're not in Christ, you've already lost it. And for those of us who are in Christ, we know we're going to win because Jesus is faithful. Our God is a great God. We're going to win. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. But maybe you've never accepted Christ. Maybe you have strayed away from him. Maybe you've you've been that person who, you know, every time you come to church, you come down the altar, you get saved, and you leave, and then you stray back out into the world. It's easy to do. Satan is successful. More people he does that to than actually finds those in Christ. The narrow path has less people on it than the broad path. He's good at what he does. But today can be different. Today can be a day when you give your life to Christ and it stays there. Today can be a day you give your life to Christ and it fits and it works. That you surrender. You stop trying to do it on your own. So if you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ or you have strayed from Him and you know you're not where you should be, then I